because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. I know he holds my life, my future in his hands. dazzling heights to pass to fly. I got so high to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept through. My heart beating, Good my morning. soul breathing. Welcome to I Otter Creek Church. We are thankful that you're here this morning. We have been, for the last several weeks, going through a series related to worship in the Psalms. And this morning, you will notice that the mood is going to be different than the last several weeks. We have learned about dancing and celebration. We have learned about joy and passion. We have learned about lifting our hands, raising our hands to God um, in surrender. We've learned about kneeling to God and humility, and we've learned about all these different Hebrews idea, Hebrew ideas connected to the Psalms, and you cannot have a worship series studying the Psalms and not practice what the Psalms do, which is lament. So to set this up, just so you know kind of what we're thinking this morning, 70% of the 150 songs in your collected book of Psalms are about loss and pain, and disorientation, and disappointment, and hardship. And so to just do a series that talks about passion, and energy, and joy, and hope would be to ignore two-thirds of the Jewish sacred collection of psalms. So this morning, we are going to connect with our Jewish brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters, in this idea that every single person in this room has some kind of deep disappointment or grief that we are stewarding in our soul. And the more I've gotten to know more people, the more I believe this is true. We all are carrying around in our body deep regret and pain about the way some things in our lives have unfolded. And it might be things that we're responsible, it may be things that we're not responsible for, but whether we lament the way it turned out It could be the loss of a friendship. It could be the dissolvement of a marriage. It could be strain or difficulty with a child. It could be a dream deferred. We don't always know exactly what it is, but I believe we all carry around these deep disappointments. And sometimes we carry around deep disappointment with how God did or did not act in the midst of certain situations. So, we have left dancing way behind, which some of you will be glad about, right? We, we are moving past into other regions of the Hebrew Scriptures to understand what it means to lament, to cry out to God, to talk to God about the way the world is, not just the way the world should be. And so this morning, we invite you into the Psalms and to understand what it means to express our hope in the midst of our pain. Let's pray together. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for every person you bring into this sacred place today, we give thanks. God, for every person who might be here for the first time, or for every person who barely made it today, God, thank you for the ability to sing and to listen and to read and to pray together. 
It's in your precious son's name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me Oh, oh. 
Psalm 46, and let me encourage you to listen with your heart and soul and spirit this morning. Maybe close your eyes and hear the mountains and the sea. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I need now unto I 
will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ Juan and I have one child, a son named Christopher. 
We adopted him when he was 19 days old. Today he's 38. And for more than 20 of those years, he struggled with addiction. For the last year and a half, because of methadone treatment program, he's been sober and trying to build a life. But we have had some really dark days with him. And 2001 was especially bad. Luana and I were desperate. Uh, we lived in constant fear of getting a phone call that said that he'd been arrested or that he'd overdosed. Uh, there were times when we honestly wondered if we would ever see him alive again. We found these candles that would burn for a whole week, and so we bought boxes of them. And every Sunday, we'd light one, and we'd let that flame represent our prayers for the rest of the week, because we were just too empty and drained and exhausted to pray them ourselves. Well, during that time, I found myself being drawn over and over again to Psalm 42. My tears have been my food day and night. My soul is downcast within me. And there was one line in particular that just jumped out. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, your waves and your breakers have swept over me. It was like that psalm was expressing my deepest hurt. Now, even my doubt with lines like, have you forgotten me? Where are you, Lord? When we were planning for the Zoe conference that year, I mentioned to the group about how much that particular psalm had meant to me. And my belief that there were lots of people in our churches who were suffering but just didn't know how to express it. And so I suggested that we concentrate that year on lament. So we chose the theme, Deep Calls to Deep. And I wrote a song based on Psalm 42 that we recorded that summer. Well, the CD wasn't gonna be released until October. But in the first week of September, I sent an advanced copy of my song to my good friend, Larry Mudd, who was the worship minister at the Manhattan Church. So a few days later, Deep Calls to Deep was sung for the very first time anywhere at that church in New York City the Sunday after 9-11. And it means so much to me to think that a song that was written during one of the darkest periods of my life helped people express their own hurt and sadness after that unspeakable tragedy. I've heard similar stories since then, and I'm just convinced that sooner or later, all of us face something, some moment, some tragedy that, that causes us to cry out, have you forgotten me? Where are you, Lord? On any given Sunday, people come to the table with that hurt, with that ache, with that emptiness. And Jesus says, come. All who are weary, I'll give you rest. There is comfort even in our darkest days in Jesus. There is comfort at the table. Jesus, we thank you for that comfort. We thank you that in our deepest, uh, darkest, most tragic moments that we can turn to you and find peace and rest in you. And as we receive this bread and this cup, may we be reminded of the hope that we have in you. May we find comfort in this meal that we share together as a family. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
the depths of my soul I cry out. 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 Lord, can you hear me? Have mercy, O God. From the depths of my soul I cry out. the depths of my soul I cry In the midst of the sea I cry out. Go ahead and ask the servers to uh, start collecting the offering at this time. And during this time, uh, man, thank you for giving. Thank you for being faithful and obedient in this moment, in these moments. And because of your giving, um, Otter Creek gets to be a part of some amazing kingdom movements. And we get to be a part of some incredible organizations and partner with them, organizations in the city and throughout the world. And this morning, we wanted to just kind of take, um, just kind of take a break and take and breathe a little bit after the the time that we've just had, and we we just want to um, spend some time celebrating and and recognizing an organ organization that we partner with. I am so thankful for Youth Encouragement Services for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because I was introduced to this organization over 13 years ago. And I met my wife, Allison, through Youth Encouragement Services. So I am very thankful for this organization. And we are thankful that there are safe places throughout this city um, where kids can come and be encouraged. They can be loved. Um, they can be taught and mentored. They can be shown a grace and love and the love of Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful for the partnership that we get to have with YES. And so this morning... 
I would like to introduce Neva Price, the Executive Director of Youth Encouragement Services. And would you just give her a warm welcome this morning? So first, I too would like to say thank you to this body of believers. Um, in the city's rapidly changing landscape, it's easy to lose sight of those families that are residing in the shadows of the city's expansion and growth. Uh, in my time at Yes, I've seen that Otter Creek has volunteered its time, has given its resources, and it's just really remembered our families and our ministry, and I thank you for that. Now, Proverbs 31, eight through nine says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now, I quickly learned um, one stat that's in your brochure that says nine out of 10 of our families make less than $21,000 a year. Really over half of them make less than $10,000 a year in a city that requires eight times that amount to live comfortably. But that stat was not the only thing that was vexing. The year and a half that I've been there, I've also seen that within a couple weeks of Christmas last year, there were three deaths connected to our families due to violence. In the last year and a half that I've been here, two former students died at the hands of gun violence, and five children who are in our program have lost their parents as a result of the opioid epidemic. One family had three relatives die just in the past year at the hands of violence. Now, considering what that can do to one's spirit, right, the sorrow, the brokenness, the debilitating loneliness that you feel in times of suffering. For our families, that's commonplace. I asked one of our kids, what does yes mean for you? Why, why do you come? And I said, well, everybody has problems here, but you don't worry about it when you're here. None of us have to think about that or have to judge each other. You know you're normal. Sort of sad because that means you're used to the pain, right? but we're still able to provide that safe place where kids can come and where the light of Christ can shine. Because we also know that in the darkest times is when the light of Christ shines the brightest. So we thank you for your continued support, um, for the justice that you all are giving through your gifts and through your volunteering. Um, this justice is providing our kids opportunities to reach their full potential, right? It's providing them hope, it's providing them true resources that can help with economic mobility and with breaking out of this intergenerational trauma that's connected to poverty. So on behalf of our kids, on behalf of our staff and all the Yes families, we just thank you for being justice fighters and for continuing to share the light and love of Christ in our communities. Um, so continue to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to, in just a moment, go to Psalm 13. If you want to make your way to Psalm 13. <clears throat> Those of you who have spent any amount of time reading the Psalms, um, you know that the Psalms do not theologize. They don't offer tight, pithy explanations about how the world works and everything that's going on in life. There's something else going on in the Psalms. The Psalms are raw and vulnerable and emotional and up and down. The Psalms depict what it looks like when you live your life honestly before God. It's vulnerable. The Psalms are angry. The Psalms are sad. The Psalms are full of despair and hope and confidence and skepticism, sometimes all in the same refrain. It's interesting, as many scholars have pointed out, that the Psalms do something different than just about every other book of the Bible. So many books of the Bible is God, through human mediation, trying to communicate to us. And the Psalms are a moment in human history where humans say, now just a second, God, we've got some things we'd like to say to you. They are uniquely raw and human. Just read Psalm 137 today, for instance, and ask yourself, is this good theology? 
talking about dashing the heads of innocent, vulnerable people against the rocks. The Psalms can feel manic if you read them chronologically, right? You get to Psalm 22, my God, my God, an important Psalm for Jesus. And then you follow Psalm 22 with Psalm 23, which is probably the most quoted Old Testament passage in the world today. They're not always great theology. It's not always tight and succinct and a a Jesus kingdom understanding of the world. The Psalms are kind of the wild, wild west of theological exploration. You've probably learned, or maybe you've never known this, but there are basically three types of Psalms, which I have found very helpful because there's so many, sometimes it feels like you can't get your arm around them. But there are basically three kinds of psalms, and the easiest way to remember them is with the life of Jesus. There's psalms of life, orientation, psalms of death, disorientation, psalms of resurrection, reorientation. And you can basically read the psalms in those three categories. You start to see that pattern then woven in all these different facets of your life. If you think about relationships... You meet someone for the first time and it's going so well that first year is such a strong year and everything is as it should be, right? And all the right songs come on the radio at the right time when you're in your your car with that person and it's just bubble gums and puppy dogs and ice cream every day. Like it's just everything is what it should be. And then life happens. You notice annoying patterns in that person or you notice something about that person that you don't actually care for and guess what? They do the same to you. That's called disorientation. Life, it sets in. Then you have to work through that. And if you work through that and you get to the other side, you're actually stronger than you were in that first season of bliss. That's called reorientation. Every college uh, roommate experience goes through this cycle. Every marriage goes through this cycle. Every parent-child relationship as the child goes from being an adolescent to an adult goes through this cycle. This pattern is woven into the seasons. Remember when we had seasons in Tennessee? It's woven into the way planet Earth is structured with cold and hot and spring and fall. There's a rhythm, right? There's a cadence to life. And so you see it everywhere around you. I love how Philip Yancey captures this. He says it so much better than I could. He says, the Psalms are not pronouncements from on high delivered with full apostolic authority on matters of faith and practice. They are personal prayers in the form of poetry written by a variety of people, peasants, kings, professional musicians, rank amateurs in wildly fluctuating mood. Psalms gives examples of ordinary people struggling mightily to align what they believe about God with what they actually experience. This is why I'm suggesting we remember that 150 of these songs move in the rhythm of life and death and resurrection because your life is a series of events of life and death and resurrection. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about raising our hands or kneelings or passion or celebration We've talked about all kinds of expressions of worship throughout the centuries. But if we don't have room for the 70% of the Psalms that talk about grief and pain, we are emotionally aborting a big part of our human experience. And to pretend each Sunday that everything is great and I'm just going to talk myself into being great is not what emotionally healthy churches do. There is a time to mourn and a time to weep as we just sang the words of Ecclesiastes. There is a time to celebrate, right? There is a time to raise our hands to God. There is a time to kneel in submission. There is a time to lament. If you root for any of the football teams in the state of Tennessee, there is a time to lament seasons of disorientation. I'm just trying to be practical, people. (laughs) I'm not trying to poke at you. I'm just trying to say the Psalms have an answer for you, football fans. So look at Psalm 13 with me. It's a short psalm, but it's powerful. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How's that an introduction to an email? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul 
and have sorrow in my heart all day long. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. But I trusted, I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So there are at least five things that I love about this short psalm. The first is this, to lament, to challenge God, to cry out to God, to question God, as Jesus models in his own life. But to do this, number one, betrays the fact that you believe God exists. Who cries out to someone who's not there? So to engage in lament, to engage in grief, to engage in this expression of profound or deep disappointment is fundamentally an act that only the faithful do. Number two, this kind of activity, this pronouncement, this questioning God, this crying out to God, also assumes that God cares. If God is vindictive, Right? If the gods are angry, as most of the world religions have taught, if God is angry, why would you bother crying out to a parent who does not care? The Psalms betray a belief deep in the heart of Judaism that sustained Judaism even through the depths of the Holocaust, that in the worst moments of human experience, God is close, not distant. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is fundamentally empathetic to our condition. Psalms like Psalm 13 also teach us that God listens. He doesn't just exist in time and space and human history. He doesn't just care. He's not just empathetic. But He actually listens to the prayers of men and women. I love the Jewish proverb that says, God counts the tears of mothers for only they truly understand how the world works. God listens. Number four, God might act. Now, he doesn't always act, and we all have stories about times God did not act, but sometimes God acts, and he moves, and he does something with our brokenness. He does something with our disappointment. That's how the psalm ends in verse 3, 4, and 5. And then as you read all the psalms, you realize that God hears, God is being asked to hear the prayers of all people. Not just my prayers about my second cousin's niece's wedding coming up, right? Or about Aunt Myrtle. But God hears the prayers of all people suffering throughout all the world. That God is not just in this myopic, in my myopic state, fulfilling everything I need like he's a vending machine and I just insert a quarter with every prayer that I offer. But that God hears the prayers of all people who call out to him. Several years ago, I read a book called Joy Unspeakable. It had a profound effect on me in understanding the role of lament in cultures and civilizations. Um, but the author at one point in the book talks about the emergence of groaning or moaning in African-American music. So in R&B, in hip-hop, in uh, black gospel choir music, in all kinds of expre expression of black culture today, you will hear moaning and groaning, and this writer goes back and traces when slaves were brought from West Africa to the New World 400 years ago uh, in what we now call the Middle Passage. When six million, six million Western Africans, the same number of Jews who were killed in the Holocaust, six million Africans brought from West Africa to the New World, many of them did not survive. Six million are estimated to have not survived what historians call the Middle Passage. And this historian goes back and she asserts that on these slave ships bringing these West African slaves to the New World, many of them spoke different tribal languages and did not have the ability to communicate together like we do in English. And the only thing that connected them as humans in their suffering and oppression was the basic guttural sound 
of moaning and groaning. And this is what she writes in her book. The moan becomes the vehicle for articulating that which can never be voiced. Moans are the utterances of choice when circumstances snatch words and prayers from bereft lips. On the slave ships, the moan became the language of stolen strangers, the articulation of unspeakable fears, the precursor to joy yet unknown. Every time I'm told about a young child who has leukemia or something that's unspeakable, I have learned over the years that words fall short, and I often find myself making noises with my voice that do not translate to the English language. We do this all the time in conversations when we are affir affirming someone's suffering. And this is how I want us to think about these kinds of psalms like Psalm 13. These psalms are the moans and groans of the human experience back to God. Isn't it fascinating in Romans 8 when Paul had a thousand metaphors at his disposal to talk about the gulf between the world as it is and the world as it should be? The Apostle Paul, this all-time brilliant mind on the same level as Plato who could have accessed a million different ways of explaining this, and he reverts to an experience of human life that he would not have known, the birth of a child. And he says, he says all creation is groaning for the renewal of planet Earth. All creation, he says in Romans 8, even our bodies groan. That's how we think about the Psalms. The Psalms are what we sing as we live between the gulf of how the world is versus how the world will one day become in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is why we can look to the music and the art of those who have suffered to show us the way to how to endure our own pain and our own suffering. In 1977, the Russian KGB arrested a brilliant Jewish mathematician named Anatoly Sharansky. For 13 years, Sharansky lived in the Russian gulag, being transferred from prison to prison, eventually ending up in Siberia. He wanted to immigrate to Israel desperately, but the Soviet Union knew if he went to Israel, he would be able to use his math skills to help them in a way that was not helpful to what the Soviet Union was trying to accomplish. And like hundreds and hundreds of other gifted men and women, they put him in prison. For 13 years, he survived, in his own words, not on bread and water, but on the words of humans in the content of the Psalms. His wife, in 1977, traveled the world, drumming up support. She came to North America, drumming up support for her Jewish husband and for his plight. And he said even the knowledge of his wife's courage did not allow him to be sustained in prison. He says in his own words, the only thing that got him through those 13 years were the 150 Psalms. In fact, in his autobiography, he describes a scene in which one of the prisoners takes his Hebrew scriptures of the Psalms and he goes outside. He got 30 minutes outside every day and he threw himself in the snow and he laid prostrate and he told the guard, I would rather die out here then live in there without the Psalms. And the guard was so impressed, he took back, he gave him back his 150 collections. For 13 years, day and night, he prayed the Psalms, he memorized the Psalms, he spoke the Psalms, he tried to remember what order they appeared in, and then would go back and check his work. He wanted the Psalms to get deep into his consciousness because there was something about the Psalms for him that were sustenance for the soul. He says, quote, Gradually, my great sorrow and my great pain became hope. So I want to model this for you this morning. I know someone in this church who has battled depression for almost a decade. And I asked them recently, tell me the psalm that speaks to you the most. And they said, Psalm 20. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. 
May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, set up your banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer his, him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots, some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. One of your brothers and sisters, that's the psalm that gets them through some of their darkest days. I know someone else in this church who got an awful medical diagnosis at a young age. And the husband and wife told me through email that the psalm that has sustained them, that meant the most to them in those dark moments of this medical diagnosis, were Psalm 55. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplications. Attend to me and answer me. I'm troubled in my complaint. I'm distraught by the noise of the enemy because of the clamor of the wicked. For they bring trouble upon me, and in anger they cherish enmity against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. Day and night they go around on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. It is not enemies who taunt me. I could bear it. It is not adversaries who deal insolently with me. I could hide from them. But it is you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend who kept pleasant company. We talked in the house of God with the throng. Let, the de let death Come upon them. Let them go down and alive in Sheol, for evil is in their homes and in their hearts. I know someone in this church who lost a child. And the psalm that meant the most to them was Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear in my pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How Long shall my enemy be exalted over me. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death and my enemy will say I have prevailed. My foes will replace because I am, will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So this morning as we pray, and as shepherds come to the front and shepherds in the prayer room and I'm in the front, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, you can raise your hands, you can raise one hand, you can do nothing. But I would ask that you listen to the inner workings of your heart and to ask God to show you what it is that you are still grieving, the unresolved pain that you carry within you. And ask God, number two, for the courage to deal with it this week. As together we pray, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for the words of the psalmist, for the courage to talk about what life looks like before you, raw and uncensored. God, as we sing, and some kneel, and some raise hands, and some stand, and some don't, God, the only thing we care about this morning is our heart. So God, if there is any unmitigated ignored pain that we have kept between someone in this room and ourselves or we've kept between us and you. God, would you lay bare before us that truth? May you do divine surgery in us in this song and help us to see any unresolved pain and grievance that we carry. God, we want to be faithful to the movement of the Psalms. So we thank you for the expression and avenue of confession and lament. And as Randy inspired us to look deeper into our own suffering, to hope and to see the way that our own suffering and faith in you might eventually bless others around us. As together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing.
grace and peace go with us as we leave here today. Amen.
Chance, you weren't planning out a pil pilgrimage thing yesterday, were you? No, I actually had this year off. All right. I get to take place today. Thank you. 